Well, good morning. And I am so glad that you are here. It is a new year. Uh, first Sunday that we have service. Uh, last Sunday was the last Sunday of the year. Pastor Pete wrapped it up well for you. Ending the year and looking back, reflecting a little bit on last year and how well we had served the Lord and pointed us to, uh, into this new year. And I am glad that we are here and that we are committed, we are focused, and that we are serving the Lord. Uh, you probably remember that last year we were preaching from 1 Corinthians, and I actually dove much deeper into it than I thought I would, but uh, we uh, only made it through 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, not only that we just learned what that passage says, why it's written, and what is written, but I believe that there were also a lot of uh, things in there that were applicable and we could apply it in our lives and we did and, and it made a difference in our lives and it was a blessing for us, an encouragement and also just an equipment to be equipped for the Lord. And I decided to continue uh, as I told you that that was my goal, that I was the focus, the aim. And if the Lord leads it, then I will do that throughout this year whenever we're done. Uh, and last, we have different events and season coming up, then we'll focus on that and we'll go back. Uh, I left the, uh, the series titled the same as just a continued. I will do that for the next chapter, uh, two chapters, chapter two and three. And I'm, I'm hoping to do like six, seven messages from these two chapters. Then I will change the series and maybe try to go a little lighter. But my prayer was I wanted it to go through this and don't just jump over things or skip things or miss out or leave out things. And so uh, that's why it also takes us a while to get through that book. But I do believe there's so much in it to learn. It's also a book that people would argue about the most, I think, in the Bible and have the most disagreements about often, uh, based on what he has written to the Corinthians. And so, I, I will do my very best to, to stick with what is in there and don't miss or, or skip anything. But when you read 1 Corinthians, there is, there's quite a bit in there that uh, I haven't been there. I, have, I haven't arrived on, that, on some of those topics yet that I really don't know for sure how I will go about them. Uh, because I, I really don't know how to, to uh, preach on that uh, with uh, an audience that would fit all of that. Uh, so there's quite a bit in there that we would eventually will run into it, but we're still in the beginning stage and we'll just enjoy it. Uh, but also, it also makes you sometimes preach then on certain topics. Do you feel like, well, I mean, it's not all that long ago we talked about it. Why would I want to talk about it again? But if, if I don't want to skip anything, then you go and you... Uh, get back into certain topics that you may have recently heard as well. This morning, our, our message is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. If you want to follow along in your Bible, you can also follow on the screen if you want. Uh, and if I start speaking quieter, it's just because my voice wants to give up on me, but then I'll just take a drink of water and hopefully that will cure everything. Uh, I know that there's people uh, probably listening online right now because they are at home and they're sick. I don't feel so sick, I just have a sore throat, and it is affecting my voice. So if it sounds a little rusty today, it's just because uh, that's what it is that I don't have control over. Um, today's message is um, cross-focused Christians. Do, I think we all know one mind track people. You know what that means, right? They have like a, like a laser focus on a single topic or a thing or an idea. And so when you spend enough time with them, no matter what, that is going to come up. That will be mentioned. It will, be, uh, it will come in somewhere in a conversation. And, and why is it? Because they can't really help it. Because that's their passion, that's their focus, that's what they dwell on, that's what they constantly are, are focusing on. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things that people can be a one mind track. You know, some people have a one track mind about their work, or about sports, or about technology, 
or about sex or about exercise or about movies or about God or about cars or food or about politics I mean, some people, you can't talk to them and they will talk about politics. No matter what you want it from them, no matter what the conversation is, it's going to turn to Donald Trump or politics or Democrats or Taco Bell. I don't know, but they're one track, mine, people, and it's going to come up when you talk to them. When you read the Bible, and especially when you read the letters of the Apostle Paul, you cannot help but realize that Christians are to have a one-track mind. And that track mind turns straight to the cross of Jesus Christ. You just examine the letters of the Apostle Paul, you will definitely notice it. And so he, here he, I think as Christians that everything we think and everything we do, everywhere we go and everyone we meet, Everything that we plan, we do, it needs to have the cross in the center of it. It needs to have Christ in the center of it. Well, let me just ask you, are you a cross-focused Christian? That is so important. Do you have a one-track mind that, that runs straight to the cliff of Calvary? And the decisions that we make and the things that we do, I know a lot of things have nothing to, to do with the cross of Christ, but our decisions and our thinking and what we do and how we respond and react and behave, it should always have the cross of Christ as a center of it. Because that changes everything. So there's no doubt that the cross of Christ consumed the mind and the heart of the Apostle Paul. And our passage today you will see that, that there is a burning conviction, there's just a blatant desire in the heart of every cross-focused Christian. And what is that? To lead more people to Christ. That is commanded of Jesus for a church to do. That's the task, that's the mission. That's the assignment of every single believer. What I'm saying with that is whatever gifts the Holy Spirit has given you are for you to use, but the cross should always be the center of it. The cross of Christ. It doesn't mean that everybody is gifted to be an evangelist or a teacher or a preacher. or like Sometimes I think we have placed guilt trips on people that, that, on gifts that God never gave them. But whatever we do, it, it needs to be cross-centered. Whether we are businessmen or farmers or working for a farmer or a business, it should be. You know, we ought to be obsessed with Christ and with his kingdom and with his family, with his cross and with his future. And when we have that, then there will be a burning conviction to bring more people to him. You know, when a policeman is arresting somebody, I have just heard it on the, on, when I watch cops on TV, and some of you may have experienced that yourself. But when a cop arrests somebody, then he says, you have the right to remain silent. Sounds familiar, right? Well, that is one right you don't have as a Christian. You do not have a right to remain silent as a Christian about the cross, about the love of God about what, who Jesus is, what he has done in your life, and whatever gift the Holy Spirit has given you, you, you do not have the right to remain silent. You don't have the right to watch people die and go to hell and do nothing. You don't have that right to remain silent. Now in our first verses that we're going to look at, the Apostle Paul takes the Corinthians back when they first met him, when they first heard the gospel, the message of Christ. And he is reminding them that they have lost their first love. Just like in Revelations, to the church of Revelations. 
They have lost their first love and they need to get back. And, and they lost their one track mind. They need to get back and focus on the cross. And then they will have, have a fresh and anew the burning conviction of leading more people to Christ. Now let us read this passage. And I used King James, the New King James Version because it had some words in it that just jumped out much clearer to me than, than the other translations. So I'm going to read it uh, from that translation. Uh, beginning verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. So he points out three things here that I want to share with you. First, Cross-focused Christians are consumed with God's message of salvation. Let me read verse 1 and 2 again. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom of, uh, or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul says, when I showed up, when I came here to you at first, he says, I came declaring to you the testimony of God. So here is not, nothing about wisdom of man, but this is testimony of God. What is the testimony of God? It's the full gospel. It is God's redemption plan through His Son. It includes creation. It includes man's fall. It includes God's judgment on sin. God's promise to send a Savior. The prophets uh, pointing to the future of the Messiah. It proves, uh, and it means, uh, the gospel, it means the coming of Christ. The birth. The perfect life. The sacrificial death of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus. The ascension of Jesus. And the returning of Jesus. This was and is the testimony of God that he came to declare. He reminds them of it. And Paul says, when I came, I did not come with flowery speech or excellent skill. He says, that's not how I came. And why is that important that Paul says that to them? Because that's what the world's philosophers and teachers did in their day. So in Paul's day, they would... They were the entertainers. They were the teachers. They were the ones that, that would create a crowd. They were the ones that, that would speak in style that made him seem so brilliant and charming and entertaining. And they would have such persuasive words that they loved him and adored him. That was the philosophers of their day. They depended on their own wisdom to create followers. And Paul says, you know that's not how I came to you. You know that was not me. That is not who I am. That's not what I did. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I did not come with excellence of speech or wisdom of the day. See, it was not that he could not. But it was that he did not. The Apostle Paul, he was very high educated. By the highest educators. He was a rabbi. He was the best education he could possibly have. And as a matter of fact, when you study the book of Acts, you will discover that the Apostle Paul could hold his ground against any argument. Even at the courts and Sanhedrins. He, he, he was very educated. So again, it wasn't that he could not, but he did not. Why? Because the philosophers were interested in, in drawing a crowd. The Apostle Paul, he was not interested in drawing a crowd. He was interested in pointing people to Jesus. 
That's what he was interested about. Not here recently, but uh, at the time when, when men's encounter was quite on fire in this community, I, I went as a server, first as an attendee, but later on as a server several times. And, and there was many men that I, I witnessed to and I shared with. And, and uh, through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, those men, they, they, were, they broke free. They were broken free from the chains of the devil. That They were tied in and they saw Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And, and they whether either recommitted or, or accepted Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And one thing that I told them, because I, I sensed the... The, the appreciation and the love and the adoration toward me. And, and not that I don't like it, but, but one thing that I told him, I told him, if Living Gospel Church is a good fit for you, you are so welcome, we would love to have you. But if it is not, I want you to know, <coughs> just because I was the pastor that God used, doesn't mean you got to be in the church where I'm the pastor. We are just one congregation. And if there is a better fit for you, where you can serve and be served, where you can love and be loved, where you can care and be cared, whether it is a language barrier, whether it is a singing style, but if it's something that is better fit for you, that's where you need to be. Not interested in, cr in, in drawing a crowd, but pointing people to Jesus and don't worry about the credit. Don't worry about where they will go, but that they will be saved and that they will be followers of Jesus. <coughs> so the Apostle Paul, he was interested in pointing them to Christ. He did not come with persuasive words and, and try to make followers of him. But by the grace of God, through the Apostle Paul, he opened their hearts and their minds, their soul, and they got saved. And that's what Paul was interested about. It is the power of the gospel that convicts and converts the heart the power is in the message, not in the messenger. <coughs> if it's in the messenger, then the messenger will create followers. And that is never going to be so good. I think in order to fully comprehend this, we must also understand where the Apostle Paul came from. The Apostle Paul had been at Philippi, and he had to run for his life. He went to Thessalonia, he had to run for his life. He went to Berea. In Berea, the Thessalonians were chasing him, trying to kill him. He had to snuck out to remain alive. From Berea, he went to Athens. And in Athens, he is arguing and discussing with the philosophers of the day. And when they hear the Apostle Paul talking about the resurrection of the dead... They mocked him. They laughed at him. They made fun at him. And the truth is Satan loves to intimidate you out of your faith in Christ by having others mock you. And that's what happened to the Apostle Paul. So Paul left Athens mostly unsuccessful. <coughs> he was on his way to Corinth, which is about a 50-mile trip, most likely by foot. So it could have taken him two to three days. And I can only imagine how he was tempted by the devil. That he was so unsuccessful and had to run for his life in so many areas. He must have been so discouraged and disheartened that he must have been wrestled as the devil tempted him that he needed to change something. Instead of just simply preaching the simple message gospel, that he needed to change tactics or a new strategy. Maybe he should focus more on what people want and not what they need. Maybe he should just fill his sermons more with, with fun and, and, uh, and emotions and feelings rather than 
just a simple message gospel, but I, I have no doubt he wrestled with it because when you look at verse 2, it really backs it up. It says, for I determined, he says. It means that he had come to a settling conviction. He carefully must have weighed all his options and said, you know what? No, I must preach Christ crucified. Why? Because he knew it to be the greatest cure for the greatest need ever. The cross is the center of all eternity. It's the message of the cross that is powerful. The message of the cross is not just making bad people better. It makes lost people, dead people in a mud pit of sin alive in Christ. That's the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul also declares that in Romans 1.16, which in Romans 1.16 he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Folks, there is never been a day as today where speakers are pressured to speak only what listeners want to hear. You are not allowed to speak something that will really cut the heart. You should only just go lighter, go funnier, go shorter, go easier. You, should, you can share with a friend about heaven or grace or God's love, but you're warned not to talk to them about the judgment against sin or hell or, or what, what will happen with unbelief. But us focused Christians that I truly believe that have truly experienced the forgiveness of their sins, that have truly been freed from the chains and the power of the devil, and have truly been baptized with the Holy Spirit, they will refuse to hold back anything. But they would be willing to share whatever is in God's word, and point people to Christ. I also think that cross-focused Christians are humbled by God's way of ministry, not their way. Look at verse 3, if you uh, would. He says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much tr trembling. Okay, part of that is already that you know that he... When he came to them first, he was really on a run. So that made him also already very fearful and, and weak and trembling. But I believe that is also God's way to do ministry through people. Not arrogant, not self-confident, not cool. Because the greatest soul winner says, I was with you in weakness. That was his physical condition. He says, I was with you in fear. That's his mental condition. I was with you in much trembling. That's his emotional condition. So have you ever been scared to share something spiritual with somebody? I mean, you just felt unfit. And you just felt so, so, so weak and so desperate and just totally unfit to share something spiritual with another person. Have you? If you have, raise your hand. I mean, I am. Well, I, I, want to, I want to tell you something. Welcome to the club. Those are the people that God wants to use. Even the Apostle Paul says that is what he was. The Apostle Paul understood this absolute overwhelming nature of this task. God had called him to share the gospel with a lost world. This, this powerful calling of this task overwhelmed him. He, he came to this massive city at Corinth. The worst sinners possible had never heard of Jesus. Nearly a million people there. And he was supposed to share the gospel with him. This powerful, shakable assignment overwhelmed him. And he was filled with anxiety and he felt unfit. 
You know, people sometimes ask me, so pastor, do you still get nervous when you get up here on Sunday morning and, and you preach? And I have to tell you, um, nervous? I mean, there's something above that. I have no word for that. It, it's, it's like way more than nervous. I, I just don't know what that's called. Like, like every Sunday morning, I, 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 I go over my message and I pour over it and, and I, I, I look at it. And, and even last night, I, I went to bed like 12.30 and I couldn't fall asleep. So I just lay there and I, I prayed to God to, to give what it takes to preach the sermon today. And I, I just pour over it. And so many times in the mornings, I look at it. And when I'm done, I, 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 I tell myself, this is terrible. This is so awful. When will I ever get good at this? You didn't that all goes on up here, did you? It's not so much that I know I'm going to stand and talk in front of people, but it's way more the incredible moment of uh, weight of this moment. Because I know that there are spiritual decisions being made at this hour. When I am up here preaching, I know that there are eternal decisions being made. I know that some of you need strength and encouragement even just to pray with your own families or share Christ with your children or your spouse. I know that, that some of you are in here and, and you're living in rebellion and you're on the run and you're running from God. And God wants to call you back and he may want to use me as a speaker. I know that some of you could possibly be even not saved and lost, and if you would die this moment, you would go straight to hell. And it breaks my heart. My mind says, Gerhard, you can't do this. You don't have what it takes. You're not smart enough. You're not godly enough. They will not listen. They will not understand. And if there's gas speakers, they will never come back. That's what goes on, and that's what Apostle Paul, he felt so unfit. But you know what the Apostle Paul tells us? He says that's the attitude, the spiritual attitude that he also had. The weakness, the brokenness. And the truth is, God, that's God's way of ministry. Our humility, our brokenness, our humbleness is really mandatory of someone that God, that are to allow God to be used and not they just try to do it themselves. It's really mandatory. The moment that I think that I can do it, I need to stop preaching. It is not me. It is God's ministry. And the moment that you think, do you have the ability to go and save your spouse or children or neighbor or relative, you better get on your knees before God. And humble yourself. And why would that be? Remember there's a passage where God says to Paul, I am strong when you're weak. I am powerful when you're weak. God takes the humble, the weak, the scary ones that are afraid. But they know what Jesus has done for them and they're going to share and, 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 and witness to others. And God takes that. That's God's way of ministry, and that's what the Apostle Paul was when he first came to the Corinthians. And he says in verse 4, In my speech and my preaching, they were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Listen, anything that you can talk somebody into, somebody else can talk them out of. If it is you, Somebody else will come along with more persuasive words, better proof, better intellect, more common sense, better skills, and bomb, they will be gone. But you know what happened if that happens? They were your disciples and not the disciples of Jesus. When you make your disciples 
they will not less. There's a big difference. Paul says, it is not the persuasive of my words, but the demonstration of the Spirit that makes all the difference. Demonstration speaks of proof. So his teaching and preaching brought proof to the truth of the gospel. You know what that demonstration, that proof is that he's referring to? The proof of the power of the gospel is changed lives. It's when our lives are changed. That's the proof of the power of the gospel. It changes lives. Paul said to these Corinthians, the proof of the gospel is that I preach that it is real, that it is true, is that your lives changed. The proof of the power of the gospel is that my life, your lives, has changed. That's the power of God in the gospel of Jesus. And in 2 Corinthians 5.17 clearly says that. It says, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. That doesn't mean that they are now 100% perfect and holy and God all the time and living perfect, but that evidence is there. There has a new life begun. Because the old has gone, the pit of, of sin taken care of, and now there's a new life. The method of God is to take the weak and the humble and fill them and empower them with the Holy Spirit and they will begin to speak that they cannot do on their own and they will begin to live like they cannot live on their own and the world will see that and they will see that is where we can find our hope because something what happened to them is what I want. And then thirdly and lastly, Cross-focused Christians are focused on God's motive for people. When we are cross-focused Christians on God's motive, we begin to not so worry about what people will think of us. We will don't mind so much what they think of us. We will care only what God thinks of us and other people. And what is it? He says in verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. And uh, we already went through this when we went in, uh, through the first chapter in this Corinthians, but in 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says what, the, what this is, the power of God. He says, for the message of the cross is foolish to those who are perishing, but to us it's who are being saved, it's the power of God. So Paul says that God wants people not to put their faith in man's wisdom. He wants people to put their faith on the message of the cross, on the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of the cross is the only thing that saves. If someone gets saved because you are so powerful, so influential, they will, get, they will give you the credit. They will say, yeah, you are so wise, you are so smart, you're so clear, you're so passionate. You are just so, so, so. You will get the credit. Well, when you want somebody to believe in the gospel, they need to place their faith and trust in the gospel, not in your faith, but their faith in the gospel. That's what, what needs to happen. If you place your faith in my faith, not in the gospel, I don't save. Simple as that. I don't save. Only the power of the gospel saves. I don't. You can, you need to place it in, 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 in a message in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because here he says, so that they will not place it in man's wisdom. So don't trust my experience. I am just sharing my faith with you as, as a witness. I, I'm sharing with you what I have experienced but don't have faith in my faith. You have faith in the power of the message because the message has the power to save. My faith doesn't. I have just, I'm just witnessing what God has done for me. And it is all in the center of Christ. Christians, we need to be cross-focused. 
we need to be one track mind it is the cross in other words that then we will have that burning desire to plead with sinners to embrace Christ so that they will escape hell and we are commanded by Jesus to do that and Jesus says it very clearly in Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 and 20 he says therefore go, uh, go make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I am with you all the way to the very end of the age we are commanded to do that we often lose focus let us be cross focused Christians we are commanded as a church to be that and we know that you know in James 4 17 it says that if we know what to do and we don't do it it's sin and I think we often we just have learned to be too fearful to just do nothing so my prayer is that we as a church and that we as individuals we will be cross-focused Christians that we will have a heart and a love and mercy and care to share the gospel and whatever gifts God has given us and reach people to Jesus Christ my prayer my focus for this year is this that God is going to use me as a tool as an instrument to equip you to do what God wants the church to do to prepare you for the people that God wants to bring at this church to be good ministers and good stewards and that God will be glorified and that his church will be built may God bless you